Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again for another one of our uh, Safer at Home series of programs. Um, I really want to thank everyone for doing this. Uh, I hope you're enjoying it. I know I am. Um, uh, so thank you for being a part of this. Uh, a couple of notes before we get started. I think a lot of you are, are veterans, so if you're getting tired of me telling you this, uh, I, I, I understand. But uh, um, uh, when you have a question down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the chat um, uh, feature. So type that in, and we'll uh, at the end of the talk, we'll, we'll go over the questions. If you would mute yourself, that would be, that would be appreciated. Um, all of our Safer at Home series are uh, sponsored by uh, Cape Cod 5, by the uh, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, and by um, uh, Martha's Vineyard Savings. And we also want to uh, make sure that we give a shout out to our friends over at Eight Cousins Bookseller because uh, they, all the books that they offer, uh, all, the, all the talks we have, they offer the books. Uh, this talk is being recorded, um, so we just want to make you aware of that. Um, and I really want to welcome our, our guest tonight, uh, John McManus, um, award-winning professor, author, military historian, with one of the coolest titles I've ever read. Uh, he's, he's a curator's professor of U.S. military history at, at Missouri uh, University of Science and Technology, Missouri S&T to, uh, to the layman. Um, and he's, so he's recognized as an extraordinary and elite scholar by the University of Missouri. Uh, would you welcome our guest tonight, John McManus. Mark, thanks so much for having me. Thanks to everybody for uh, for tuning in tonight. Um, you know, I would have loved to have visited tonight, but this is the next best thing. I'm glad we could do this. I'm always excited to discuss this topic, which I think is just absolutely fascinating. So um, I just kind of want to take you through the, the world of the Army in the Pacific tonight. Um, and just to, to sort of show you this map, it gives you a sense of the vastness of the theater. Um, this is about one third of the, of the world's surface uh, with a massive expanse of ocean and islands and continent. And it was so vast that Allied war planners uh, eventually, of course, as you can kind of see from the dotted lines there, uh, are gonna carve the theater up into different layers of responsibility in part to, to have a kind of compromise between the Army and the Navy as to who controlled what, but also because of the just the vast uh, geographical spaces made this a necessity. Um, so specifically, I want to address uh, what tends to be the popular perception uh, in, in this country, at least, of the Pacific War as being fought on the ground by the Marine Corps and, of course, everything else by the Navy. Um, and, you know, I've encountered this attitude even from people who are quite knowledgeable about World War II. Um, I, I had a recent conversation with somebody who was, um, you know, extremely conversant with World War II, has even done some work on it. And uh, this person said to me after we discussed my book, you know, I didn't even know the Army fought in the Pacific. And I thought, wow, you know, if, if someone who really studies World War II, um, you know, understands more maybe than the average person still thinks that, um, well, then there's a need to really delve into this. So, so why is, is the Army's role in the Pacific so obscure? Um, and I think there's several factors in play. Um, the Germany first policy in World War II certainly um, has an impact. Uh, the priority went to Europe. The priority went to defeating Germany. And I think to some extent, our historical coverage has tended to follow that same route, in part because the majority of Americans served in, in that part of, uh, of the world rather than the Pacific. So that's a factor. Um, obviously, the maritime nature of the Pacific theater. I mean, you look at this map right there, you can just see how, how vast uh, the ocean is and, and how this is going to be a seaborne war to some extent. And so I would never argue otherwise, of course, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't going to be some pretty uh, major land operations that almost compare with what's going on in Europe. Um, the domination of Douglas MacArthur, whom we'll discuss more about in a moment, as this kind of overarching personality who kind of sucks the life out of, out of uh, you know, sucks the air out of the room uh, in terms of uh, exploring the rest of the army story, even the, the story of some of the soldiers under his command and most notably some of his key commanders. Um, there was unbalanced press coverage for obvious reasons. Um, you know, if priority was going to Europe, uh, so were journalists to a great extent. There was a great deal more infrastructure uh, communications infrastructure and otherwise to report on the war in Europe versus the Pacific. Um, you know, and so I think that uh, sometimes historians will tend to follow that lead uh, 
um, you know, whatever the journalistic coverage was at the time. And I think certainly that's a, that's a factor here too. Uh, I think another factor is the troubling brutality and savagery, racial savagery of the Pacific War is not always a pleasant thing to explore. And the other thing about it, it's a kind of uncomfortable harbinger of many of our wars ever since. Um, so I think that to some extent we can kind of shy away from, from exploring that because it's not terribly pleasant. Um, also the humiliating nature of the early defeats. Uh, which we'll, you know, we'll discuss a little bit tonight. Uh, the U.S. for about the first six to nine months of the war really gets its clock cleaned, and that is not always pleasant for Americans to to go back and look at that as some pretty pretty difficult stories. So, uh, the other thing too is the exotic alien locales. Um, you know, think of it this way: if you're in the market for going on battlefield a battlefield exploration tour somewhere in World War II, looking at some World War II battlefield, um, are you going to choose? going to Normandy or going to Vela La Vela or Guadalcanal, you know, so it, it's pretty obvious there. So these places where many Americans fight in, um, in World War II in the Pacific are really only notable because of what happens at that moment in time. And these are otherwise kind of out of the way places that Americans cared little about before or since, and have had honestly very little geopolitical importance ever since, at least in American terms. Um, but in truth, 1.8 million American uh, United States Army ground soldiers served in the Pacific Asia Theater in World War II. That's the third largest army this country has ever sent overseas to fight a war, behind only the, the um, European armies in World Wars I and II. The third largest army, um, and yet it's kind of anonymous. And I'm not even counting, by the way, the Army Air forces, which of course I think as many of you know, the Air Force was part of the Army in World War II. I'm not even counting that. I'm just talking about the ground soldiers. Uh, so when we talk about amphibious warfare, which one look at that map shows you're going to be fighting an amphibious war, um, the Army actually carried out the vast majority of invasions. During the, the entire expanse of the Pacific War in World War II, uh, the Marine Corps carried out 15 amphibious invasions. Um, in a five-week period alone, in the spring of 1945, uh, Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger's 8th Army carried out 35 amphibious invasions. And of course, there were many, many others carried out by Army soldiers in the course of the war. Um, the Marine Corps mobilized six divisions at full strength. It's the largest the Corps has ever been in its history uh, during World War II. Um, the Army mobilized 21 divisions, plus many regimental combat teams, tank battalions, engineer brigades, artillery units, and the like that added, of course, many, many more divisions worth of manpower. Uh, so I'm kind of speaking up for guys like this. Um, the average Pacific Theater uh, GI, who really did not have the good fortune, at least in posterity's sake, uh, to fight on a famous European theater battlefield like Normandy or maybe the Battle of the Bulge and who did not necessarily receive the, the post-war attention and so many accolades and yet I would say they fought just as hard if not harder uh, and generally in much tougher environment than, than many of their comrades in, in Europe and elsewhere. So it's, I believe it's, uh, it's important to remember their war. This is what it tended to be, wading around in terrible swamps that none of us would ever want to get near. Um, you know, and, and, and dealing with everything in terms of combat and, and uh, privation and, and whatever else. So I also want to caution my purpose tonight uh, and in writing this book is not at all to denigrate the Marine Corps. Not, it, it, not at all. In fact, quite the contrary. It's absolutely incredible what the Marine Corps did uh, with such a small amount of manpower in World War II. Um, and of course, the, the record of the Marine Corps in that war and every war is, is just uh, obviously outstanding. And I, I, of course, is not here to dispute that. Um, so my purpose is really to kind of round out the picture somewhat and to perhaps expand our contextual understanding and knowledge of what is, I think, an extremely important moment in not just American history, but world history, and to understand something of the, the kind of socio-cultural and, and um, socio-political aspects of, of what the Army, Army's participation meant. Uh, and maybe a little bit about what it was like for these kind of guys uh, who are fighting and dying in remote parts of the world. Um, there's countless themes and harbingers that kind of come to light as you study this. Um, and most of them are not terribly pleasant. Um, I alluded to one a moment ago, uh, just the, the incredible savagery of the fighting really foretold um, much of um, what you're going to have in terms of American ground combat 
uh, in the post-war world. So really from Korea to the 21st century, uh, you're going to see that kind of um, give no quarter, ask no quarter combat is going to tend to be the, the reality for Americans once they're in action. And you certainly see that in the Pacific. Um, this is an ideological and cultural clash, which tends to be the case in modern American wars. Uh, and the Pacific War is really no different. It's a war in which um, the, the American opponents fight with no morality, at least as Americans might have thought of it, or perhaps Westerners might have thought of it. And But I would also point out, Americans will have to struggle to maintain and define their own morality of what kind of rules of war um, we will recognize. An example I would give you is that, uh, you know, entering World War II, Americans wanted to observe the Geneva Convention rule of uh, not, you know, purposely shooting and killing medics. Uh, well, the Japanese are going to kill any medic they possibly can, and almost any medic who served uh, Army medic in the Pacific Theater is going to learn pretty quickly uh, to disguise that Red Cross or to, to shoe it all together and perhaps even to carry arms, which was against the 1929 Geneva Convention. So um, that's an example of what I mean, that uh, the Americans are going to have to kind of explore their own morality in light of uh, what they viewed as the barbarism of their opponents. And of course, that's going to be the case to a great extent ever since in, in every war we've fought ever since. Um, with a few small exceptions like Grenada, Panama, Mogadishu, every subsequent American war has been fought somewhere on the Asian landmass. Uh, and the Pacific Asia War is kind of a harbinger of that too. Obviously much more so than, than the war in Europe, which is a, fortunately a one-off kind of thing. Um, it also shows us that uh, wars are going to tend to be fought and decided on the ground. As important as air power and sea power are, as revolutionary as air power will be in World War II, uh, nonetheless, 90% of American war deaths from World War II through this day have been uh, incurred on the ground, and most of them by Army soldiers. Um, it also shows, the, the Pacific War does, the importance of understanding culture to have influence. You're going to see this in many places throughout the Pacific, uh, from New Guinea to the Philippines to China to Burma, wherever. You're going to have Americans doing what we'll later think of as special forces type missions with indigenous forces in places like Burma, in, Philippi, in the Philippines, South Pacific Islands. Uh, it'll accent the importance of working with allies. That's a similarity with Europe, of course. The last time this country has fought a, a major war without any allies uh, was the Spanish-American War. Uh, so the war in the Pacific is certainly a good illustration. Um, it highlights the frustration, too, of, of dealing with allies, um, not just close allies like the British and the Australians, but also uh, one of the most tragic alliances in American history with Chiang Kai-shek's uh, nationalist Chinese government, uh, and of course, you could argue what happens there with the nationalist Chinese government eventually, uh, you know, losing out to the communist Chinese, the, the Chinese Communist Party is really the defining event of the 20th century and certainly still affects us in the, in the 21st. That's another byproduct of the Pacific War. So um, you also see the, the vital importance of inter-service coordination. You have to. And that map that I just showed you, the Army isn't going anywhere without the Navy and kind of vice versa. Um, so you're going to see those lessons learned as well. And of course, the Pacific War is going to unleash all sorts of, of uh, anti-imperialist, kind of non-white nationalistic forces uh, that the, the Americans are, are not really going to be able to control or deal with in the, in the longer run. So as you can imagine, there's, there's a lot of aspects to, to cover this, a lot of personalities, a lot of battles. Um, you know, for that, obviously, you have to buy the book and read it, which I, I always advocate, obviously. But um, um, since it wouldn't be much fun for all of us to just sit here and read the book, uh, you know, together tonight, I'm just going to fixate on a few highlights for you uh, to perhaps give you the flavor of uh, Fire and Fortitude in the story as a whole. Um, let's start with the great elephant of the room. Here he is, the aforementioned General Douglas MacArthur, um, the famous corncob pipe and the sunglasses and the perfectly adorned cap, which he had uh, specially custom made, which certainly gives you an insight into the man. Um, on a very good day, uh, MacArthur's ego might have fit into the Grand Canyon, perhaps, uh, if things were favorable. So uh, he's, um, he's someone who has a kind of a vainglorious sense of his own destiny, his own greatness. He's a very self-centered military personality. Uh, you may know he's the son of a, of a general, a Medal of Honor recipient, Lieutenant General Arthur MacArthur, who is a Civil War hero on the, on the Union side, of course and ends up 
as the American military commander in the Philippines during the Philippine-American War around the turn of the 19th and 20th century. And this begins a longtime love affair between the MacArthur family and the people of the Philippines. Uh, and Douglas graduates uh, West Point in 1903 and is posted to the Philippines. And of course, this is the beginning of many, many years he will spend there. And of course, I, I had mentioned his personal regard for and love of the people of the Philippines. Um, MacArthur had become, uh, he had served in World War I. He had uh, earned a great combat record in World War I. He was heavily decorated. He'd become the superintendent of West Point at the, the very young age of 39. Um, he had become chief of staff of the Army at age 50. He had a pretty remarkable career by the 1930s. Um, so he's, he's pretty young to be retiring in his early to mid 50s. And his old friend, um, Manuel Kazan, who was the, the uh, first president of what was going to be the newly independent Fi Philippines, invites him to come to the Philippines in 1936 um, to, to oversee the creation of a, a, a military force that can defend the archipelago. Uh, so MacArthur jumps at this opportunity uh, to, to go back to the Philippines and help out uh, an old friend and help out the people he had loved so much and to go back to Manila, a place he almost considered to be his hometown. Um, Interesting thing about this, uh, Congress had passed something called the, the Tidings McDuffie Act a couple of years before that. And it pledged that the United States would give the Philippines its independence in 1946. So MacArthur's kind of racing against the clock to get the Philippines militarily ready for its independence when it's quite obvious to, to, uh, to everybody that war with Japan is looming. Um, now, the War Department, of course, had prepared for this eventuality, if we'll call it that, of war with Japan, was something called War Plan Orange. So if you look at the Philippines, and you can just see that the vastness of the archipelago, over 7,000 islands, including, of course, the, and I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but um, you can see that Luzon there in the north is the, is the largest main island in the dominant culture, the Tagalog-speaking uh, folks of Luzon, and Manila there, and Manila Bay, and this is sort of the heart of what had been American imperialism in the Philippines, and this transition hopefully, to an independent Philippines. And um, War Plan Orange was predicated on the idea that, well, the Japanese are closer. They're probably going to be better prepared for the beginning of war than we are. Um, so they're going to get ashore on Luzon and elsewhere. We realize that. So why don't we just um, hunker down in the Bataan Peninsula, really good defensible ground there, a lot of high ground, a lot of mountains. Let's hunker down there, and we will hold out, and we'll hang on to Manila, and meanwhile, the United States Navy, the Pacific Fleet, is going to fight its way to us, defeat the Imperial Japanese Navy in a fleet engagement, reinforce the archipelago, and then we will, you know, destroy Japanese military forces there and hang on to the Philippines. Well, MacArthur sees this as too defeatist. And he says, nonsense. Um, you know, the, the Japanese, we don't even want them ashore at all. So we're going to defend everywhere here at the coastline. Um, so he discards War Plan Orange. And I, I would argue, only my opinion, Seldom in American history has a commander um, so badly mismanaged a campaign and yet been perceived by his countrymen and many future historians as a great battle captain, perhaps even a, a genius. Now, granted, his position is extremely difficult, um, but he made his errors and his discarding of warplane orange made a bad situation infinitely worse, and I'll illustrate why in a moment. Um, one challenge he's got is the, the hollow nature of his army. Um, you've got all kinds of different people from around the archipelago who speak different languages, who have different tribal cultures, and you name it. Um, and so, you know, we may have a platoon of about 40, 45 guys, and six or seven different languages may be represented. You have sprinkled among them American military advisors who are trying to command them and train them and, you know, whatever else. Um, it is a very difficult situation. You don't have enough arms. You don't have enough equipment. You don't have enough food. Um, the, the War Department is not even funding the U.S. military forces in the late 1930s, much less the Philippines. So this is a shoestring operation, and this is a truly unique army in American history in that it's a colonial army comprised of about, you know, one-fifth of the manpower is American and most of the rest Filipino. So MacArthur has that challenge, but he now makes things worse by losing the bulk of his uh, Air Force on the ground to lightning Japanese attacks within about two days of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And he had known Pearl Harbor happened, he knew war was going on, and he still lost most of his air. Consequence of that, 
is the Japanese, once they control the air, are now going to control the sea. And of course, they've um, inflicted damage on the Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor, too. Obviously, that's a factor as well. But uh, U.S. naval forces are kind of compromised here as well. And it means the Japanese are going to get ashore. So War Plan Orange um, is really more appropriate, and yet MacArthur has discarded it. And what happens, of course, when the Japanese do invade in December 1941, they're going to get ashore, and MacArthur's forces are going to quickly unravel. Now, his, to his credit, he re-embraces War Plan Orange. But the problem is um, it, it, the, the discarding of warplane orange has terrible logistical consequences. Think of it this way. If we were depending, if we were planning that we were just going to be defending here in the Manila, Bataan area, uh, we can compile all our logistical stocks there. All our food, all our ammo, all our weapons, everything else we need is going to be right there. And we could probably hold out for a pretty good long time. But when you discard that plan, now your logistical depots are all over Luzon and elsewhere. And there's no way you're going to be able to move all that stuff to Bataan. So when he goes back to Warplane Orange and uh, he, he gets, you know, he withdraws his army by around New Year's Day into, um, into Bataan, um, you know, by that time, most of the army's food is left behind. Um, and, of course, obviously, that's a, that's a terrible, terrible consequence. So um, the other thing, too, you'll hear some historians um, you know, kind of lionize him for salvaging his army and getting it to Bataan. But what, and, and one of the reasons they'll think that is they will believe his communiques that uh, the Japanese outnumbered him terribly, that he was just on the shoestring and uh, he heavily engaged and all that. No, actually allied forces in the Philippines campaign in 41-42 outnumbered the Japanese by a factor of two to one. Um, so the Japanese were also operating on a shoestring. Uh, they were not well fed. They were starting to get racked by disease. Uh, you know, they just, uh, they controlled the air and the sea, and that allowed them to really set the tone for much of what happened. Anyway, though, uh, the army gets to Bataan, uh, this is again by, by about January 1942, and MacArthur's quartermaster estimated the following food situation. You have left 30 days of rations, thir uh, 50 days of canned meat or fish, 40 days of canned milk, 30 days of flour, uh, 30 days of canned beans and tomatoes, and 20 days of rice. Uh, so that's not going to last. Uh, you might ask, well, what about local food sources? Not really. Uh, the army was slaughtering 30 to 40 animals per day in the early months of 1942. That meant for you as a soldier, you were getting about maybe six ounces of meat a day. Um, Japanese air attacks put an end to, to uh, efforts to fish the waters off Bataan. Uh, so that cut off that food source. Plus, uh, the local population was there and they, they still had to eat too. So you were looking at a, uh, a hopeless logistical situation. Um, by January and February, you, you as a soldier are now on half rations and then quarter rations. You can imagine what that means in terms of disease, tropical disease, and, and uh, fighting morale and all that kind of stuff. Um, bad, bad situation. And yet in spite of this, the Army fought very hard. Interesting thing about the Philippines campaign in 1942. Uh, the Allies don't necessarily lose because they're tactically defeated. They lose because they're logistically defeated more than anything else. Um, soldiers were spending the bulk of their time scrounging for food. Um, and many of them are just going to become too weak to fight. Um, and, and by the way, you know, as I said, the Japanese are not particularly well fed either. Uh, but they have more sustenance of reinforcement and resupply than eventually the, the Allies will. Uh, the Japanese, though, meet many... Uh, tactical defeats in small unit battles around Bataan. Uh, they have people at times cut off, uh, slaughtered uh, almost to the last man. You, you see the beginnings of the, the Japanese ethos of not surrendering, seeing um, becoming a POW is very dishonorable. Um, one of the things I found in the research is just a lot of great Japanese sources to give the Japanese point of view. Um, there were a lot of captured diaries. That, uh, that then were translated and, and have survived all these years that are remarkable documents. I found one from an Imperial Japanese Army doctor who along with a small unit was cornered somewhere in Bataan and knew he was gonna die. And he wrote in his diary, I've made up my mind, I will not have a disgraceful ending. Uh, I went back to my patients and told them it is better and more honorable to die with a pistol shot than to be captured. Uh, so, um, you know, in spite of, Situations like that, uh, obviously, the, the military situation overall is going Japan's way, um, and it appears that the soldiers on Bataan are doomed. Uh, 
Um, within just a little bit east of, uh, of Bataan and before you get to Manila is an island called Corregidor. And it's sort of a, a uh, fortified island that uh, is a sentinel as you enter Manila Bay. And uh, MacArthur's headquarters was on Corregidor. He's living a kind of subterranean existence. The U.S. Army engineers had built uh, ma a major tunnel complex called the Malinta Tunnel Complex in, uh, in Malinta Hill. Um, and yet uh, MacArthur was releasing communiques that made it seem like he was over on Bataan leading troops at the front. Uh, we can only document that he actually went there once, but it didn't mean that being on Corregidor was safe. It wasn't. He was getting, Corregidor was getting bombarded uh, by air and ultimately by artillery once the, the Japanese secured the Bataan Peninsula. MacArthur lost 25 pounds in two and a half months, um, and he has a constant worry over uh, the presence of his wife and toddler son, Arthur. And I think that's worth exploring because it's an insight into MacArthur's leadership and character. Um, in May 1941, when it was clear that war with Japan could happen at any moment, the War Department gave orders to the United States military forces in the Philippines for all dependents to leave and come home for obvious reasons. Everyone's wife, everyone's children left except MacArthur's, his wife, Jean, and his young son, Arthur. Uh, and that's an example that sometimes he will feel the rules do not apply to him. Uh, she will be with him throughout much of the war, and so will this child. This child is now exposed to combat. And of course, if you think about it, certainly that's going to affect him to some extent. It couldn't help but affect him. Um, and I think it's fair to say it does at, um, at Corregidor. Well, um, FDR, of course, as you probably know, orders him out uh, in late February 1942. Because MacArthur was a well-known military figure, because his communiques had built a kind of cult of personality around him, made him seem like a, a major genius and hero, um, FDR believed it would be devastating to American morale if he was captured, but also what would happen to Gene and Arthur? Would the Japanese uh, rape and kill Gene? Would they kill Arthur? You know, what, how would the American people react to that? Uh, these are factors, too. Um, now, MacArthur, of course, did not want to leave because he felt, you know, it would be very dishonorable, but ultimately he will comply. And in a court, sort of famous cloak and dagger and, and uh, swashbuckling adventure story, he gets out of uh, Corregidor uh, on PT boats, he and key members of his staff, and then they, they get uh, down to Mindanao, which you can see here in this uh, huge island at the southern part of the archipelago, where they pick up uh, a B-17 that flies them to Australia. And of course, he famously gets to Australia and says, I shall return to the Philippines. I this, I that, of course. But uh, and in a way, kind of commits the United States to, to coming back to the Philippines in a major campaign. Um, he, of course, is uh, bestowed with the Medal of Honor, as his father had been before him. And he's one of only, he's one of only two father-son recipients of the, the Medal of Honor, the others being uh, the Roosevelts, uh, Teddy Roosevelt for San Juan Hill and his son, Ted Roosevelt Jr. for Utah Beach um, on D-Day in World War II. Um, but it's really kind of a political Medal of Honor. Uh, it's, it's not for any kind of particular valorous action, though MacArthur was courageous at Corregidor, no question about that. But it wasn't quite like, uh, you know, an Audie Murphy kind of situation. Um, the, he, what is not well known is um, MacArthur will accept a half million dollar personal payment uh, from the Philippines government, from President Kazan, who also got out. Um, and that's almost $8 million in, in today's money that went into his personal bank account. Um, and three other members of the staff also took personal money, uh, Dick Sutherland, Dick Marshall, and, and Sid Huff. Um, so meanwhile, Lieutenant General Jonathan Skinny Rain Wainwright has to take over these uh, forces after MacArthur leaves, and he's left with this debacle uh, this sort of hopelessly checkmated military situation in which um, Phil American forces will ultimately surrender in April and, and May 1942, one of the, the worst, uh, terrible, most traumatic defeats in American military history. Um, about 21,000 Americans and almost four times as many Filipinos were consigned to the horrors of Japanese captivity that spring and summer in 1942. And by and large, the Japanese treated them with terrible neglect, cruelty, and even outright brutality. Uh, so let's explore that in a minute. And, and through the eyes of this man, um, you have, of course, the infamous Bataan Death March, which you all know about, all have heard about, I'm sure. Uh, and, and by the way, if you served at Corregidor, you would not have been in the Death March. Um, that's for people who served 
a Batan, obviously, as the name would indicate, people who are captured in April and are then uh, marched, herded about 60, 65 miles to central Luzon into captivity. This man you're looking at here is uh, an example of someone who endured that death march. This is Lieutenant Colonel Harold K. Johnson, uh, United States Military Academy, class of 1933. Um, he had been a commander and a staff officer of what was called the 57th Infantry Regiment. Um, these were called the Philippine Scouts, uh, that unit. And it was comprised of um, full-time professional Philippine soldiers who also served um, alongside with and sometimes under the command of professional American soldiers like Johnson. Uh, the Philippine Scouts were outstanding soldiers and uh, held in extremely high regard. Um, so Johnson has obviously led and dealt with them. Um, here he is now in the middle of the death march. Privation, thirst, hunger, low morale, misery, neglect, chaos, exhaustion, the worst situation you could possibly imagine. Um, he is uh, from the state of North Dakota originally. He is married to, uh, to Dorothy, whom he thinks about constantly as he walks footstep after footstep, mile after mile, about on the verge of dropping from sheer exhaustion. And the interesting thing about Harold Johnson, as the situation got worse, it brought out the best in him. Many other people, of course, I think it's, you know, for many of the rest of us, it would be the opposite. For him, it simply brings out the best. Uh, and to Johnson, ethics almost equated to life and to survival themselves. Um, that in a way, he didn't want to survive, it meant giving up his ethics. Leadership to him was about selflessness and professionalism. It was not about military glory. He really didn't care about that at all. And as the conditions grew worse, he actually started to become more ethical, uh, more concerned with others, and more spiritual, too. He became very spiritual, and he'll later say about the Bataan Death March, God was very close and very real in those hours. Um, the march claimed the lives of 600 Americans and between five and 10,000 Filipinos. And that's a rule of thumb here at this stage of captivity. Um, it was much worse to be a Filipino soldier. The Japanese treated them worse, and the death toll was higher among the Philippine soldiers. There were more of them, of course, but even proportionally higher. And the Bataan Death March is an example of that. The survivors were consigned to a terrible hellhole called Camp O'Donnell in central Luzon, where conditions were even worse, if possible. Um, for over two months, Allied soldiers died in droves there. Hundreds per day, from disease, thirst, starvation, um, even the arbitrary beating or execution, though that wasn't very common. You were the eternal enemies of Japan, Captain Yoshio Tuniyoshi, the third-rate small-minded commandant, told the prisoners in a, a welcoming speech, and we will fight you and fight you for 100 years. He even came to tell them that uh, the officers no longer had any leadership or status, that they were all the same, they were all worthless, and he couldn't care less that they all died. That's the kind of person you're dealing with here in this captain. Um, the prisoners subsisted on rice gruel. And really, uh, the worst problem is not necessarily a lack of food, it's a lack of water. Uh, dehydration is a real issue. They waited in line all day under a tropical sun for a canteen of water. Chaos reign, little leadership. Uh, there was a hospital of sorts, and within that hospital was a kind of um, death center called the Zero Ward, as if you had zero chance of getting out alive. Uh, and forgive me for the, the graphic nature of this, but this is the way it was. Uh, men were dying awash in their own excreta, in their own vomit. Um, as uh, one prisoner later said, death was easier than life. It was as easy as letting go of a rope. A lot of people quit hanging on. So after surviving the death march, Johnson fell prey to malnutrition and a terrible case of dysentery, which of course can kill you from dehydration. Um, and he ended up in the zero ward and actually was one of the very few to survive this hellish place. And he later said, I don't know why, I just know that I came out. Many others are less fortunate. By the end of June, 1,547 Americans and between 21 and 26,000 Filipinos died at Camp O'Donnell. The Americans, a one in six fatality ratio, Philippines, almost one in three. The survivors ended up at a POW camp called Gabanatuan, uh, where the death rates persisted uh, at a high level throughout much of that summer and early fall of 1942 until a better organization bit more food, medical care, helped to stabilize conditions into merely poor rather than overtly deadly. Um, the leading scholar of uh, Camp O'Donnell uh, will later call it 
and, and he, he himself was an alumnus of Camp O'Donnell, a guy named uh, Colonel Johnny Olson, uh, a friend of Johnson's, by the way. Uh, we'll later call it the Andersonville of the Pacific, after, of course, the, the most infamous camp of the uh, POW camp of the Civil War. As we know, I should point out, too, um, the South didn't corner the market on, on terrible treatment of prisoners in the Civil War, both North and South uh, had nothing to be proud of in that regard. But Andersonville, I think, has survived in our memory as the most infamous place. So Camp O'Donnell certainly was a lot like that. Now, Johnson takes a major role in the improvement of Cabana's mind. Uh, he was restored to some semblance of health, and he organizes an efficient, fair, and vital commissary system to procure food, medicine, other necessities from the outside world, um, from otherwise very friendly Filipinos. And he's unanimously chosen by his fellow prisoners for this job because of his impeccable honesty and consideration for others. Because if you think about it, the commissary position could be the most important in some ways because it could be life and death. He made sure that no one was going to be excluded, that people who didn't have any money or resources, that people would, uh, would that they would still get uh, some food, they would get their share. He collected for them, uh, you know, money that would help buy them blankets or whatever else. Um, he was a student of human nature. He figured out how to work productively with the Japanese by ingratiating himself with them, building trust, and ironically enough, deceiving them, as honest as he was, he obviously wasn't above deceiving them if it meant the betterment of his fellow prisoners. And he did this through monthly audits in which he would cook the books so that he'd have more money to go buy more stuff for his commissary. He kept an illicit diary, which is fascinating. Um, and he put, uh, he wrote this one day, he said, my commissary business is booming. Um, and indeed, the death rates plummet by 1943, life stabilize and normalize, uh, though prisoners remain hungry, underweight, prone to disease. Uh, but I think it's fair to say, you know, that Johnson's ascent begins here. And as you're looking at him in this picture, I'll point out some things. You'll notice a two-time recipient of the Combat Infantry Badge, once obviously for World War II, but he also will be a battalion commander, infantry battalion commander in Korea. And he's a four-star general, and eventually, as some of you may know, he becomes chief of staff of the army, uh, you know, in the 1960s. Well, this is your strategic situation in the wake of this Philippines debacle. As I mentioned, you know, the army and the navy are going to carve up areas of responsibility. But um, to, to focus here on this, this is the Southwest Pacific area under MacArthur. And you can see his ultimate goal probably is to get back, back to the Philippines. Um, he first is going to think in terms of securing and defending Australia. Uh, there's concern in 1942 that the, the uh, Japanese are going to invade Australia. Fortunately, that does not happen. You have some key naval battles like Midway, uh, like the Battle of Coral Sea, and so on and so forth. But you have fighting, of course, on the ground in, in New Guinea, in this part of New Guinea, the southeast part called Papua New Guinea. And MacArthur has um, authored a counteroffensive. And I should point this out, too. At this early stage in the war, until about the fall of 1943, it's the Australians who are really taking the lead and carrying the load in terms of ground combat fighting. Uh, eventually, the Americans are going to send a lot more people there. And by the time you get to the Philippines, the Australians are kind of an afterthought to MacArthur and the Americans. But at this point, the Australians are really something of the lead partners. And obviously, they have a major interest in this and defending their homeland. Um, so you see this kind of dual uh, American and Australian uh, counteroffensive. I'm circling here this town of Port Moresby, which uh, the Japanese had hoped to capture as a sally port to invade Australia. So that's the southern coast of New Guinea. Um, that's what the, the Battle of Coral Sea is all about. Who's going to control those waters there and the Japanese wanting to invade Port Moresby? They fail. They try to capture it over land in 1942. And this is an absolute dismal failure. They're not logistically prepared. Uh, prepared they're not prepared on any level. Uh, this is some of the worst terrain to fight in in the entire world. I mean, there's no place, good place to fight a war, but this is particularly terrible. Jungles, no infrastructure, mountains. Look at the Owen Stanley Mountains here. You've got peaks over 10,000 feet. Um, there's, the, the climate is awful. It's uh, humid and hot. Um, and you practically look at New Guinea and you've got malaria. You know, there's yellow fever, dysentery. Um, Typhus, scrub typhus. I mean, it's just, it's just horrendous. And so, you know, you got a lot of challenges just existing there, much less fighting. Uh, but as the arrows show you on, on this map, uh, the Americans and the Australians had begun an overland campaign to secure the north coast of Papua New Guinea. Purpose of this 
is, of course, to make sure that Port Moresby is okay, but to make sure the Japanese have no bases here on the northern coast and to capture those bases for the Allies so that they can continue to move along the New Guinea coast and eventually get to the Philippines. MacArthur is very concerned as we get to about November 1942, and this campaign is kind of dead ending and going nowhere, and the very journey across the, the neck of the Papua, Papua New Guinea is almost a, a deadly nightmare for the soldiers who are part of it. Um, he's very concerned that the, the Japanese are going to come back with enough reinforcements to turn back this Allied advance and then capture Port Moresby and defeat him once again as they had at the Philippines, okay? But the, the point I wanna make too, we're not looking on the map, but also the Battle of Guadalcanal is going on concurrently with this. And as Americans, we tend to look at these as two completely separate battles, New Guinea and Guadalcanal, because they were under two separate commanders, MacArthur in New Guinea, uh, Halsey and the, and the Marines, and eventually uh, substantial units of the US Army at Guadalcanal under Alexander Patch. But from a Japanese point of view, and I think really a more fair historical point of view, there are two battles within the same campaign. And one of the reasons the Japanese lose is because they're spread so thin by having to fight in these two separate places that they could never be strong enough to, to win, okay? So um, the whole thing is let's secure these areas here, uh, Dobadura, uh, Buna, Jerua, Gona, before the Japanese can come back after winning at Guadalcanal. So that's what MacArthur's up against. And as this thing becomes kind of a crisis, uh, and as American troops are stalemated here before Buna, where the Japanese are heavily fortified, he's worried he's gonna be defeated again. One thing he has done, he's figured out, you know, I can airlift guys over the Owen Stanley Mountains. Uh, you know, I can get, troops there in 45 minutes, whereas it would have taken a month and practically half them down with disease if they go by land. So the Allies are starting to develop a greater maturity in airlift and air power potential, and that gives you a little insight into that. So nonetheless, they're still made it at, uh, at Buna. So MacArthur will turn to this guy, um, who, as I would argue, uh, probably the best American commander you've never heard of, uh, Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger. Uh, U.S. Military Academy, class of 1909, was a classmate of George Patton, and they were very close friends, and they were very similar uh, in terms of their operational philosophy. They're very aggressive. Um, Eichelberger had served, whereas many of his colleagues had served on the Western Front of World War I, he had actually served in Russia as part of the polar bear expedition to try and snuff out the Bolshevik uh, uh, regime in 1919 or 1920. He'd seen combat there. He'd, uh, he'd been an intel officer. He'd had a lot of experience. He'd also seen the Japanese firsthand. Um, you know, so this was a guy who had been pretty well schooled and prepared for the Pacific War on a lot of levels. Um, he had a, um, a true soulmate, his wife, Emma, to whom he wrote every day during the war, sometimes twice, three times a day. Um, you know, they, they had no kids. They had the, each other and they had Bob's career. Uh, so he's very ambitious, but he's also very honest in his own way, but very aggressive. And this is kind of the chance of a lifetime for him. So MacArthur and Eichelberger had known each other a long time. MacArthur uh, um, summons him to Port Moresby, and he, he tells him about the situation of Buna that's stalemated, and he wants the Japanese eliminated there. And he basically says, take Buna, Bob, or don't come back alive. So imagine if your boss told you tomorrow, you know, do this or don't come back alive. Well, that's what Eichelberger's facing. Um, before he left to go there, he writes to Emma. He says, you may be sure that I shall always be with you in my thoughts. As I think of all the years we have been together, I know you must realize how my admiration, respect, and love have increased. So here he goes uh, by plane. Buna, and this is your situation in the perimeter. So you saw the sort of macro map a minute ago. This is the micro map that shows you the perimeter. And the thing to understand about this, most of the area is sloshy, marshy swamp and jungles, like impassable. Any, um, you know, negotiable land, any uh, trail or whatever is heavily fortified, heavily covered with pillboxes like, uh, like coconut log bunkers and the like. Uh, so all of this has been completely stalemated. You have a United States Army National Guard unit, 32nd Infantry Division, that has been uh, just sort of uh, ground down into just to, just to kind of stymied there um, around a lot of these spots that you're seeing. And it's just, it's just a terrible nightmare. 
strong interlocking uh, log reinforced bunkers on every avenue of approach. Poor supply situation. Soldiers are hungry. They're lucky to get a ration or a third of a ration a day. They're demoralized. The conditions are lousy. Swamps, disease. Front lines are unstable. There's no patrols. There's inertia. There's lethargy. One officer described the troops as, quote, filthy, fever-ridden, practically starved, living in a tidal swamp. Um, the guy who's in command here is a major general named Forrest Harding. Highly thought of in the Army. He's a classmate of Eichelberger's. They're old friends. It's a very awkward situation. Eichelberger wanted to, to give Harding the benefit of the doubt, and he did until he went to the front and realized that Harding had not done this. And he went to the front and saw these conditions, and he especially could not forgive the supply situation because, see over here where I'm pointing at this new strip? You've got supply dumps here, but the stuff isn't getting to the front lines wherever you needed it to be around the rest of this perimeter. And Eichelberger just believed that was inexcusable. So unfortunately, he, he relieves his old friend who blamed Eichelberger for it and never forgave him. It was a very awkward thing for the class of 1909 uh, for the rest of their lives because uh, then, you know, you were with the Eichelberger faction or the Harding faction kind of thing. Horrible thing. Um, but it was much worse, obviously, for the soldiers. Eichelberger ordered a pause, uh, improved the supply situation quite dramatically reorganization. Then he decided, I'll launch a major attack to overwhelm the Japanese because MacArthur's breathing down my neck that we got to you know, win this thing quickly and that time is of the essence. Um, well, it's a failure. As one soldier put it when he was talking about the, the, the Japanese defensive positions, they were practically impenetrable to our fire. You could look right into one and it looked like the jungle. An operations report stated, our troops could not fight as units, but rather as individuals in twos and threes. And Eichelberger kind of yields to this reality. He's like, I can't throw masses of people. I got to infiltrate and I got to take these guys down in death by a thousand cuts. Little small unit actions wherever I can move people. And he figures he's got to be there at the front to make sure these, these patrols and little attacks work. So he's really, you know, leading at the front almost every day. He's got a carbine or a Thompson submachine gun. He's almost killed many times. Um, he has two aides who are badly wounded enough, two key aides, to be evacuated. Um, he's constantly trying to get people to go forward. He loses 30 pounds in a month. Uh, Eichelberger is really a born combat soldier, and he only knows one way to lead, from the front. Um, he, he still finds time to write to Emma. Uh, torrential rains are pouring down. It's just a miserable environment. And he'll later say, no one could remember when he'd been dry. The feet, arms, bellies, chest, armpits of my soldiers were hideous with jungle rot. MacArthur is impatiently prodding him for final victory. Eichelberg is worried about getting relieved. And, you know, he's very career conscious too, like MacArthur is. Um, MacArthur is issuing communiques that make it seem like he's at the front leading soldiers in combat. In fact, he never once visited Buna. Never once. Um, now the second half of December, though, the only good news, the Japanese were even in worse shape in all these little bunkers where they were that you can kind of get a sense of on the map. Um, they're riven with disease, malnourished, isolated, dying in droves. They hadn't been reinforced. They hadn't really been resupplied because so many resources were going to Guadalcanal. What a discouraging and miserable state of affairs, Sergeant Kiyoshi Wada told his diary during this time. Trees have fallen, limbs have been cracked, and the hospital's in a horrible plight. What is going to happen to us? Another, sad, another soldier sadly wrote, every day my comrades die one by one and our provisions disappear. Many penned farewell letters to loved ones, though few of the letters, of course, got through. I would like to write a few lines before I die, one soldier told his wife, quite poignantly, I think. You have a fine soul, one that is rare in this world. By chance, you married unworthy me, and you devoted yourself faithfully to me, and I will always be grateful. However, your devotion will have been in vain, as I will soon die for our country. Well, bit by bit, as the map shows you, Eichelberger soldiers uh, kind of gnaw away at the Japanese perimeter, taking uh, key position after key position, overwhelming the Japanese. Um, the fighting finally peters out on January 3rd, 1943, with the complete annihilation of the Japanese garrison, which, of course, is not going to surrender. The Americans buried hundreds of their bodies. And again, apologies for the graphic nature of what I described here, but this is what Luna was. Uh, some are swollen yellow-green carcasses. Yank correspondent Dave Richardson wrote of the Japanese bodies. Others are sun-bleached skeletons with tattered clothes covering their white bones. Um, as the battle ended, um, Eichelberger had won the first American ground victory of World War II, and yet, yet this is largely forgotten. 
Um, what he wanted was publicity and glory, like his friend George Patton. And he gets a little bit of it, but not much. He expects laudatory treatment from MacArthur, but MacArthur um, that was not the kind of person who liked to share the stage with anyone else. Once Eichelberger had gotten that publicity, MacArthur will sort of uh, consign him to a training role until he needs him again in combat. Uh, Eichelberger will later find out that MacArthur had um, taken steps to, to scotch a Medal of Honor recommendation for Eichelberger. And I think Eichelberger might have, he at least deserves serious consideration for it, but he will never get it. And so his resentment against MacArthur will build. He will serve him loyally for the rest of the war, but be disturbed by, you know, the, what he sees as MacArthur's duplicity and, and hunger for publicity and political power. Uh, so in tandem with, um, you know, the, the uh, Australian victories at, uh, at San Hernando and Gona that happen alongside Buna. Um, now you have this drive across New Guinea that's going to take the better part about the next two years, because uh, New Guinea is just a huge place. Uh, it's also, as I mentioned, the most remote and undeveloped place on the planet, uh, teeming with disease, no infrastructure, crushing heat and humidity. Uh, a lot of situations like this, like you see these guys here. Um, you know, the conditions of New Guinea presented a, a significantly greater challenge than did the Japanese. Uh, Lieutenant General Brian Somerville, the head of Army Service Forces, um, will describe this very well. He wrote, the Army is really fighting two battles, one against the enemy and the other against the jungle. Average annual rainfall spanned between 100 and 150 inches on New Guinea, portions of it. Every place is different, of course, but temperatures climbed into the 90s, sometimes beyond, humidity about 90%. Jungles and swamps, like what you see here, um, teamed with insect and environmental borne disease, so much so that I really view the Pacific War, at least this stage of it, um, to some extent as an interspecies war, uh, a war against insects and some level of wildlife too. About 54% of all hospital admissions were due to disease uh, for the Army at this point. In 1943, the Army lost five men to malaria for every one they lost in combat against the Japanese. Uh, unfortunately, the disease was usually not fatal, but uh, the Americans lost 12,000 man days per month to malaria. Uh, when a soldier went down with malaria, he spent on average 25 days in a hospital, uh, and the disease usually recurred. Scrub typhus now comes into play too, as I had mentioned a few moments ago. Uh, and they found that it was transmitted by tiny little mites um, on, on the tropical grass. Uh, it had a 5% fatality rate, so it was, you know, nothing to dismiss, but malaria was the bigger problem. In late 1943, 17 malaria control units uh, composed of epidemiologists, entomologists, biologists, were attempting to fight the malaria problem. They sprayed insecticides, what were called bug bombs. Uh, you can imagine how healthy that must have been. And they just stank to high heaven, this, this sort of powdery dust that they, they just flame out <laughs> everywhere and, and uh, in an attempt to, to kind of kill all the insects. Um, they flamed breeding areas, mosquito breeding areas, with diesel oil. But, you know, it was impossible to eliminate all the mosquitoes this way. The only real solution was pharmaceutical. Uh, medics ruthlessly enforced regular doses of atabrine, uh, a malaria suppressant. Not really a cure, but it would suppress the symptoms. Um, rumors got around, uh, untrue rumors, but you can imagine how difficult this would be if you're a commander. Uh, rumors that uh, atabrine would cause sterility. Um, what was true is it could cause occasional psychosis, like one or two people out of a thousand. Um, you know, but uh, what, it, what tended to be quite common with atabrine is it would cause a yellowing of the skin. If you were a white person, um, your skin would get progressively more and more yellow. And it would, be, it would have been possible um, in the 1940s to pick out a Pacific Theater veteran, uh, if, he, if he was a white person, uh, of the yellowed skin, uh, very much so. And atabrine would tend to be the cause of that. Uh, now, the medicine kept the disease under control, though, as I said, it only suppressed the symptoms. Life in New Guinea, as you've sensed, is hard and brutal. Almost no amenities, at least by American standards. Uh, morale was usually pretty low. One battalion commander wrote his wife, there are only four things that will keep the soldiers happy. Fighting, drinking, gambling, and women. And in New Guinea, none were available in anything like the quantities that soldiers desired. Uh, soldiers fermented their own noxious jungle juice, as they called it. It was uh, this kind of makeshift, nasty uh, mix of, junk, of fruit juice, raisins, potato peels, other detritus, fermented in the sun. Uh, it would pack a powerful, like 100 to 180 proof wallop. Uh, 
in one fairly typical unit, and I'm not exaggerating here, one fairly typical unit, uh, about one third of the men were not only usually too drunk to go on guard duty, but too drunk even to stand up, if you can imagine that kind of situation. Um, because of severe cultural taboos about any fraternization with local women, and whether white or African-American, most Americans did not find local women attractive in any way. Um, venereal disease rates were almost nil, whereas in Australia, uh, some units had nearly a one-third infection rate. Um, but uh, New Guinea, you, you at least did not have to worry about that. But such, such was the sexual tension in theater uh, that medical unit commanders assigned armed guards to escort their very few female nurses wherever they went, ostensibly to protect them from, the Japanese, from Japanese patrols, but in reality, as one officer admitted in official report, quote, to discourage incidents of sexual harassment and fraternization. In a sad sign of the times, security tightened even more when African-American units came into proximity with white nurses, as if black soldiers presented some sort of special threat. Um, there was a kind of dark underbelly of depression, problem drinking, suicide, and mental illness that festered among the troops in New Guinea. Neuropsychiatrists estimated that psychological problems, including psychosis and neurosis, affected between 5 and 10 percent of the soldiers at any given time. In one extreme case, Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth Kinsler, commander of the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment, uh, became so despondent that he committed suicide by shooting himself in the heart. And he did this while he was on a, while he was on a date with an Australian nurse. Now, athletics helped morale immensely. Uh, wherever the Americans developed bases, they soon established leagues for baseball, uh, softball, football, volleyball, even ping pong. Uh, boxing matches were common too. Outdoor theaters afforded a hugely welcome diversion on New Guinea. Um, occasional interruptions by rain, uh, by, by uh, Japanese air raids, uh, really did nothing to dampen the enthusiasm for entertainment in the form of movies and also live productions, uh, the USO shows and the like that you're, that you're going to have. Um, over a three-month period at one typical base, soldiers at 43 different theaters took in 453 shows, just to kind of give you a, a, a feel for what was going on. The Army logisticians, engineers, port battalions, and quartermasters worked veritable miracles to carve viable bases and ports out of the New Guinea wilderness. Allied armies on the island required 340,000 tons of material per month just to subsist. 340,000 tons. Once landed, so you can kind of get a sense from looking at this picture, um, cargo degraded from the elements, from insects, mold, animals, um, everything from blankets to medicine had to be protected, moved, and stored properly. By the end of 1943, engineers had constructed nearly three quarters of a million square feet of warehouse storage space just for that purpose. Previously barren places as Oro and Milne Bays turned into thriving bases, almost like many American cities. Uh, the population of Oro Bay swelled to 50,000 soldiers that year. The base now had, get this, 125 miles of road, eight operational runways, 35 bridges, multiple hospitals, and eight docks. Milne Bay did not take that lying down. By the end of 1943, it boasted 12 docks, 37 bridges, 130 culverts, 10 jetties, 20,000 feet of pipeline, plus scores of administration buildings. Uh, MacArthur's theater of operations in the course of the war received some 2.1 million measurement tons of material. It was such a staggering quantity uh, that absorbed so much naval and merchant shipping that the army even maintained its own little fleet of barges and cargo vessels, inevitably dubbed, of course, MacArthur's Navy. So where does that leave us as 1943 comes to an end? You have the split theaters that I alluded to, and just to, to just give you a very quick synopsis of that, MacArthur's Southwest Pacific area. You can see the rest of the Pacific is going to be under uh, MacArthur's chief rival as he sees it, not as this man sees it, uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz, the commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet. But this is such a vast area that he is going to have to split that up under various commanders, most notably in the South Pacific area under Admiral William Halsey, with whom MacArthur gets along very, very well and works very closely with through much of the war. Um, the Army is going to fight not just in the Southwest Pacific area, but under Halsey in the South Pacific, of course, at Guadalcanal, and at New Georgia, Vela La Vela, places like that. Uh, you're going to have, ultimately, the island hopping campaign, uh, mainly under naval auspices, but you're going to have Army units there, uh, such as uh, the 27th Infantry Division in the Gilbert Islands at Macon. 
You're going to have the 7th Infantry Division invade um, the island of Attu in May 1943. So the Army's fighting many different places in the Pacific, and I hadn't even mentioned uh, you have over here in China, Burma, India, Lieutenant General Joseph Stilwell, um, you know, presiding over an army command there that is hoping to keep Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese in the war to tie down the massive Japanese amounts of manpower and resources here. Uh, so it's an obviously burgeoning, growing war. The Allies had turned the tide. The Japanese are increasingly on the defensive, trying to hold on to what they had captured in the early days of the war. But the naval, aerial, and now ground force balance of power had begun to favor the Allies, as did, of course, economics and industrial numbers. Um, so the U.S. Army had made a lot of mistakes, as we've seen, and had plenty of deficiencies. But it was now maturing into a formidable modern force. Uh, with effective leaders who had been tested under the most challenging of circumstances, like Eichelberger, just as one example. Uh, and in short, I believe it's fair to say this army had become characterized by its fire and fortitude. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, I would be glad to, to attempt to answer. Thank you, Mr. McMahon. That was, that was awesome. Um, you. A couple questions. Uh, you know, as you started your talk, and you're talking about how almost forgotten or uncomfortable Americans are talking about the uh, Army's uh, involvement in, in the Pacific in World War II. In many ways, I've listened to it. Could you, make, could you have made the same preamble if you were talking about Korea or Vietnam? You know, that, 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 it, that Americans have kind of viewed those same wars also in Asia, and I don't know if that's part of it, is because they're in Asia, that they're wars that are almost not necessarily forgotten, but not as well remembered or romanced as certainly the uh, the the uh, Western front, the European front was in World War II. Might might you have had that same opening if you were talking about Korea or Vietnam? Absolutely, and I think and I think because you, you have that in Korea and Vietnam because the harbinger of it is the Pacific Theater against Japan in World War II. I mean that is. In a way, you could say the what happens in China, ultimately the Chinese Communist Party coming to power, the massive failure of American policy and the, the you know, Chiang Kai-shek's regime being consigned uh, to Taiwan and all that, you could say that leads to wars in Korea and Vietnam. Um, you know, it's, it's almost unimaginable to think that the U.S. would have fought wars there if uh, Chiang Kai-shek had remained in power in China. And of course, what you'd already seen in terms of uh, the, the nature of combat um, you had seen a level of brutality. You had seen a kind of racial cultural element to, to American war making at the, the uh, spear point bayonet level um, that you're also then going to see in Korea and Vietnam, and you're going to see it in the 21st century too. Uh, so this isn't always a very comfortable thing to, to explore, but I would argue it's, it's really more indicative and more important than studying the war in Europe, which I, you know, obviously is very important. But in terms of if we really want to know, want a glimpse into our future, in studying World War II, I think it's it's really more instructive to look at the war against Japan than the, than the war against Germany. Uh, you certainly talked about MacArthur. Are historians taking another different, better look at MacArthur as opposed to the hero worship? How, what What's the modern his, historiography right now on MacArthur? Yeah, the hero worship tended to be in place for about the first 20 to 25 years after the war. Um, when the, 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 um, uh, sort of the cult of personality still remain. And there was a political component to, to this as well that I didn't necessarily have a chance to get into tonight. MacArthur had run an underground campaign for the presidency in 1943 and early 1944. He had used members of his staff to coordinate with Senator um, uh, Vandenberg from Michigan to, to try and get the Republican nomination to defeat Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, I view that as very troubling. I don't know about anybody else, but uh, so MacArthur had this kind of political dimension already, and of course, then you're going to see it in Korea, too. And so if you didn't like the Truman fired MacArthur in Korea, and you didn't like the outcome of the Korean War and American policy there, uh, MacArthur seemed to loom as this sort of great figure who represented absolute and total victory and, and uh, honor and American honor and all these kinds of things. Well, as we started to penetrate the veneer and, and look into to, uh, you know, some of his actual behavior uh, and some of his actual ideas, I think, uh, you know, you know, then, yes, historians then will have a different view of him. And uh, I think that that's positive. Now, I'll also say, you know, that there were some very positive aspects of MacArthur, too. 
Uh, certainly he was, he was extremely bright. He cared deeply for the soldiers under his command. Um, he, he loved the people of the Philippines and, uh, you know, obviously um, that meant a lot to him. He treated people, you know, in his personal dealings, uh, unfailingly with courtesy, uh, with dignity. You know, so MacArthur certainly had some good qualities, but also he had these other larger troubling qualities and this kind of whiff of megalomania and vaingloriousness and certainly ego, kind of egomaniacal side that, um, that was certainly troubling to, to many people at the time. A question here, was there ever fighting in New Zealand? Um, there's not really like major combat. And of course, the New, New Zealand is in the war uh, from, from the beginning and, uh, you know, they're they're obviously going to be coordinating with the Australians. But the interesting thing about the New Zealanders, and the Australians can relate to this too, the better part of their ground armies are absorbed in the Mediterranean theater. Uh, you know, most notably in the Battle of Crete in 1941, but even more famously in the Battle of Monte Cassino in 1943, 1944. Uh, they suffer terrible casualties at Cassino. So New Zealand, to some extent, is quite dependent upon the U.S. and Australia to defend it in terms of air power and sea power. Uh, so no, the, the Japanese don't really get close enough there. And I wouldn't try and claim that there's, there's no danger of any kind, no, no outlier Japanese subs here and there or something like that. But no, there, there's no Japanese uh, invasion of New Zealand, fortunately. Well, I want to thank you for giving us the time tonight. This was, this was fascinating. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, the, the book is Fire and Fortitude. It's by John McManus. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for, for, for doing this virtually. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. This has been tremendous. Um, so again, uh, uh, thanks, for, thanks for shedding some light on this. It was awesome. Sure. Thanks for having me. I had a great time. All right. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Take care.